Welcome to Insights. Uh, this is your host, Jerry Kokian. Uh, today's show is going to be sort of a review of the past three years. Uh, on April 23rd, 2018, three years ago, uh, President, or at that time, Prime Minister Sarah Sarkisian resigned, and it was seen as the, the beginning of the new era and the post-revolutionary era in many ways. And what we're going to be talking about is sort of doing a review of the last three years, which in many ways have been some of the most difficult, uh, tragic, and glorious years in our nation's history. Uh, three years ago to today, Serge Sarkisian, to his eternal credit, uh, facing massive resistance and a massive uprising among the people that he was ruling, decided to step down without spilling any blood. And this is something that I think history will give him credit for. In looking at the past three years, I think we need to look at them very, uh, you know, objectively and cold-heartedly in a way, uh, sort of an unemotional look at what has been the positives, what have been the negatives, and what have been the disasters of the last three years. I think the biggest uh, victory or the most positive outcome out of the revolution was that the old world of the oligarchs was to a great extent smashed. Uh, monopolies have been greatly reduced in their scope. The business climate is far more open. There's a lot more opportunities for people to do things. And this is especially true in rural areas, which frankly were under almost feudal rule during the, during the rule of the last regime. Uh, and this is actually somewhat explains the support that the prime minister still enjoys in rural areas because those rural fiefdoms have been destroyed and replaced by systems that are far more open. The second thing, which I think is a positive development, was in the way that we have a process in which subjects are turning themselves into citizens, where people have far more demands, far greater demand, and great far more demand far more accountability from their government. And we have seen a development in our democratic institutions, as difficult as it has been, and we've seen this in the post-war period, that despite the political crisis that the country has been through, we've actually find, found a way via having elections in June to work our way through this and to hopefully move in a better direction. And lastly, as the, the last great positive of the uh, revolution has been the fight against corruption, which has been significant, and especially on the front of tax collection, because we have a state that's collecting more than half a billion dollars more in taxes than it was before, almost entirely from a whole class of people that were not paying their taxes and pocketing them. So we've had this process going on in which uh, uh, we have more state capacity to take care of our social needs, while systematically there's far less corruption, even though I think that's been accompanied by uh, a lot of ineptitude because we have systems which are corrupt but we're working, and in some ways we have systems that are not corrupt but aren't working, but that's for another day. In looking at the failures of the post-revolutionary time period, as far as the structures of the state are concerned, I think the biggest failure is the lack of reform in the judiciary, which was the easiest thing for the government to actually tackle, because the judiciary in this country has absolutely no credibility, and they have utterly failed in accomplishing that over the last three years, which is something that should have been first on their agenda, because if you're going to have a country with the rule of law, you cannot have it with a judiciary that is not working. The second, and obviously far more important in many ways, was their lack of understanding to the extent that the army and its leadership were rotted and corrupt and incompetent on so many levels. Uh, obviously, a, a government that knows the state of its army would have approached foreign policy in a different way, or would have made it a mad rush to reform their military in a much faster scale than they were doing. And lastly, the place that we have seen the least amount of uh, growth is in the competence of the state. And this, this, we keep going back to this word competent. We do not have a competent state. Now, granted, building a competent state is not something that can really be done in three years. It's a process. But it's a very slow process. And it's, it can, it's fair to say that this government has failed in coming through and creating a more competent state. When you judge the last three years, a sort of a pattern emerges. And the pattern is in things that involved tearing down bad things from the old system, uh, this new government has actually been fairly successful in doing that. Where it has failed is in creating 
uh, the processes or the systems that can actually move things forward. So we're very good about do undoing the negative negativity of the past, but there's a lack of organization, a uh, lack of leadership, and a lack of skill in actually reforming the state and building a competent state and a competent economy and a competent military. Yeah. Looking back over the last three years outside of the revolution, obviously the most significant event of the last three years was the Artsakh War of 2020. And what did that war do? Uh, in some ways, to quote the great American author James Baldwin, it, uh, it woke us from the vast gray sleep which we call security. Uh, the security that we thought we had won or we had earned did not exist. And we need to be very clear about this and we need to be honest about the outcome of this war. The outcome of this war was a disaster uh, in so many ways and in some ways has put this country, at least on the issue of Artsakh, back 25 years. Uh, our faith, uh, and specifically the faith of the people in Artsakh is no longer in our hands. Uh, in, the, in the same way that 25 years ago, other people, uh, in this case the very regressive Azeri regime and Russia, have as much say in the future uh, of, in the lives of people in Artsakh as we do. And that is something that did not exist for 25 years after our victory in the first Artsakh war. So we need to be very honest about this and we need to uh, come to grips with it and deal with it pragmatically, strongly, while we're working to build up the state and the military. I think in some ways, however, none of these things ever happen in a vacuum. And the events of last year uh, were really a preview of what the world is to come over the next 20 years. But as with anything historically, we managed to be the tip of the spear and the first victims of the world to come, in which uh, lawlessness is far more the order, state collapse and uh, other kinds of calamities far more common. So I think we sort of get a head start in being able to organize and prepare for the next 20 years of things that are likely to come our way for many, many different countries. Uh, what should be our response? Our response should be a simple one. Uh, outside of building this competent state, we need to look at building a garrison state, a military industrial complex and an army that is once again capable of entirely defending Armenia and defending the people of Artsakh. Uh, for 25 years, you know, we had a habit of doing toasts to the army, but you don't build an army by doing toasts to it. You build an army by making sure it's led by competent people, that it is well funded and has the best training available to win the wars of tomorrow. When looking at the past three years, uh, I think one of the things that is clearly stands out for me, uh, and I say this as a diasporan, has been the general failure of our diaspora and our diaspora institutions. And I want to be very careful about what I mean here. I do not mean individuals. Uh, there are countless individuals, in fact thousands, in some cases tens of thousands of individuals that are very dedicated and doing great work in support of Armenia, in Armenia or in individual processes, or in, in individual projects. So I'm not talking about that. I'm speaking about collectively, uh, how our institutions are approaching uh, state building efforts uh, or other economic building uh, efforts in our media. Uh, you don't build a state on millions of dollars. The scale is in the billions of dollars. And I can give you an example from the war. You know, during the war, on is probably the greatest success it's ever had. Armenia Fund raised $170 million, which came mostly from tens of thousands of Armenians who individually gave much more than they could. You know, they took from their vacation money, they, they took extra money that they did not have, and they donated to the cause. But we need to look at this realistically. That $170 million could have actually been given by one person. Uh, if you look at the collective wealth of the wealthiest Armenians in the world, uh, the 20 wealthiest Armenians in the world have a collective wealth being conservative that's above $50 billion. And outside of a few individuals like Ruben Bartanyan, who's essentially Armenia's first citizen, people like Sam Simonian who set up TUMO, or Samvel Karapetyan who has significant investments in the real estate sector here, the people who could do the most for our country have done the least. What we needed in the post-war period are a couple of very basic things. And again, 
this state building is expensive. It can't be done on the cheap. And we know what state building on the cheap has led to us over the last 30 years. Uh, what we need is billions of dollars in setting up the actual, in securing our new borders, rebuilding the army, uh, and something as simple as getting a few hundred thousand donations of uh, COVID vaccinations which will do a great deal in cutting down the number of deaths that we have in this country from COVID and actually helping our economy recover faster, specifically the tourist section. And there's no reason that with the number of wealthy people we have out there that this is not doable. And lastly, and most importantly, is to invest in this country's economy. This country is actually has a very limited and small economy, so you can actually have tremendous impact by working on investing here, bringing jobs here, and creating employment. However, with all of these issues and all of these shortcomings, none of this is nothing that cannot be reversed. Uh, I have always said this before, and I'll say it again. We are a free people with agency, and free people historically have always been able to solve their problems. Uh, even if some ways you know, we think we're in hell today or in very difficult situations, there is a road out of hell, and the road out of hell is to be cold-blooded, in your pragmatism, be dedicated to hard work, and hate mediocrity. That is what will turn this country around. Let's get to work. Thank you for joining me in this week's Insights with Erica Cookie.